Sing along with us right now. Sing, I need you. I need you. You need me. You need me. We're all a part of God. We're all a part of God. Oh, stand with me. Stand with me. Agree with me. Agree. We're all a part of God's body. We're all. to me I need you to survive the next part it says this I pray for you and you pray for me I love you I need you to survive I won't harm you with words from my mouth I love you I need you to survive
it's true. I need you. Mm. Mm. Wow. Wow. Well, peace, friends. My name is Tom. I'm the pastor here at Sycamore Creek, and I'm so glad you have joined us for worship. That was Anna Maria Horn and some of her uh, friends from other churches singing that song, I Need You to Survive, that was came out of the prayer demic that we did on Memorial Day weekend to stand against racialized hatred over a hundred church leaders um, and white Christians in the Lansing region have signed on an open letter to stand in solidarity with our black and brown brothers and sisters in Christ and, and it will really just anybody, um, black or brown uh, uh, folks, and to say, you know what, the, the racialized hatred that we're seeing in our nation is, uh, it's gotta stop. Um, now, I want you to know, there's a, there's a really significant temptation right now for white people after we watch a video like that. And, and the temptation and the pitfall is to say, you know what? I'm not racist. My church isn't racist. It does stuff with black and brown churches. Um, and and I don't ex I, I'm not burning any crosses. I'm not wearing any like, you know, Ku Klux Klan stuff in my backyard or my basement secretly. So I, so I'm good. Like, you know, my church, my church covers me. Um, and, and that would be a major mistake right now. Okay. Because this work of racial reconciliation is a long haul work, a long haul work. The Ingham County Commission on Health or Health Commission declared that racism is a public health emergency a public health emergency. And I don't know what you think about what that means, but what I think about is that COVID has been a public health emergency and we have changed everything about what we do to respond to COVID. And if racism is a public health emergency in the same way, then we have to change everything about what we do, not just sing a song. I mean, so the temptation right now is to feel like, you know, okay, we sat down and we sang Kumbaya with some black people and now we're good. But I'll tell you what, friends, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. So there were some really specific calls to action from uh, that prayer demic. And I want to have uh, Carola put those up on the screen. Um, those calls to action, were one is to sign the letter. Um, you can go to the Lansing Prayer Demic Facebook page and sign that letter. And you can share that letter out, share the prayer demic out. Um, another thing is to continue your education, all right? Here's one thing that, that my brown and black uh, friends tell me is that people of color are tired of educating white people. They're tired of it. We, we have got to take some of that responsibility on our own. Um, and so educate yourself about race. Now, there are black and brown people who are in the ministry and like feel like they're called to be missionaries to do some of that work. And one of them is Congregations Organizing for Racial Reconciliation or CORE. And you can sign up, you can express interest for that. We do a workshop once a, or twice a year. Um, the one's coming up, it's scheduled for September 10th. And you can express interest on your connection card today, sycamorecreekchurch.org slash connect. Worship across race. I mean, that's one of the easiest things to do right now. I mean, you can go participate in Epicenter of Worship, The Mix, um, Church of Elohim. You, there's, they're, they're all, it's super easy right now, okay? Um, Anna Maria is asking for musicians to write original worship songs about this moment and to send them to her. Um, and, and that's a, if, if you're a musician, um, Jeremy, uh, others in our church, uh, you know, put your creativity on and, and write an original song and work with Anna Maria on that. She wants to compile that coming out of this. All right. Now, one other piece, you may have noticed that I and three other pastors that are friends of mine and colleagues, started a video podcast this week called Perspectives. Four pastors talk about race. We did four episodes back to back, um, went, went Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And you can find those on the core um, website, but we're gonna start doing it weekly this next week on Thursday nights, all right? So that's another way to educate yourself um, to participate in those live events at 8 p.m. Um, this, this work that we have, again, I just can't emphasize it enough, it is long haul work, okay? Long haul work. Um, and if I wasn't a worship service, I'd add a couple other words in there, okay? It's, it's hard work. And, and we, we've, we've committed, I think, as a church to it over the long haul. Um, thank you, God, for Sycamore Creek. Thank you, God, for Anna Maria. Thank you, God, for um, all of the churches that are trying to stand um, against this, not just when it's in the headlines, 
um, but give us the strength and, and mercy and perseverance and endurance we need to do it for the long haul, um, to really treat this like the public health emergency that it is. In the name of Jesus, in the power of the Spirit, and all who agreed said or typed, amen. All right, let us know you're out there. Type amen in the comment section. Um, type it here in Zoom. And, uh, and, and that amen is saying, I agree that I think racism is a public health emergency, and we got to change everything about the way that we do church, the way we do community, the way we do politics, the way we do world. Like, it's, it's all... It's, it's got to change the way that COVID-19 has changed us. All right, we are in um, a series called I'm In. We're like, I think this is the set. Yeah, it's the second week that we're in it. Last week, we looked at I'm Invited. Today, we're looking at I'm Invaluable. Our kind of theme for this is like this fire. Like, do you have this fire inside of you? And you're like this coal that's out here by yourself. And do you get in the fire? Are you in the fire? We had a close call at our house here at the Parsonage a couple of weeks ago we left a space heater on it sent scorches up the wall and we unplugged it and we turned the circuits off and we had to call 911 um, and the fire department came to our house. Um, it turned out to be nothing, but there's a hole in the wall of our basement now that we're gonna have to repair at some point. But we're doing all that in the midst of quarantine. Um, and, and so all of a sudden you have these firemen in your house that's been this sort of space that you've provided. And so I knew like what, like the sort of fire thing was like um, on, on that side of it. But I was curious, what is it like from the fireman's perspective? I mean, these guys and gals are going into people's houses in quarantine all the time. So this past week, I had a conversation with Tom Roush, who is a, who is a partner at our Potterville campus. And he's also on the East Lansing Fire Department about what it's been like for firemen during COVID-19, all right? So here is that interview. Well, friends, I'm here with Tom Rausch, uh, who is a partner of Sycamore Creek at our Potterville campus. He and his wife, Danielle, and um, they have two kids, Isla and Jude, and one on the way, Tom. Yep, yep. <laughs> Do you know yet whether it's a boy or a girl? No, we're finding out that day, the day the kid's here, so we'll see. Uh, okay, all right. Well, congratulations on that. That's a, that's that's kind of a bit of hope in the midst of this other bigger right. challenge is that, yeah. that there are still life does continue to go on. Yeah. Um, so besides, uh, expecting a baby, um, what, uh, what, what has it been like for you personally, this whole shelter in place thing? Um, I mean, it's been, actually, it's been pretty good considering the circumstance. I mean, we're, you know, like you said, sheltering in place and, and taking our precautions and that's got even our kids a little bit on edge. But uh, other than that, just when we're home, the family time has just been great. We're actually able to slow down and, and uh, spend quality time with each other where before it just, we're always on the go. Yeah. And um, there was always something going on, whether it was Isla's dance or doctor's appointments, um, stuff like that. So it's, it's been given the circumstance, it's actually been really good for us. Yeah. I've heard a lot of people and I've described it as like we downshifted. Um, yeah. All of us downshifted. Yeah. So you had an excuse to say no to everything. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Is I, Isla, is Isla in kindergarten? Yep. She's uh, finishing here very shortly. Okay. Are you doing um, homeschooling or is, uh, is Danielle doing most of that or? She's doing most of it, but when she goes into the school, I, I do some. You do but some of it too. She's doing probably at least three quarters of it. Yeah. yeah. So you, uh, you're a fireman um, and you, you work out of the East Lansing Fire Department, um, which firefighting doesn't, that seems like a pretty essential job. Yeah. What, what's, what's it been like in the fire station and what's it been like doing your job amidst COVID-19? Uh, they, they put a different, they put a couple different uh, policies in place to kind of keep us um, as clean as possible. Uh, we've got like a boot washing station and um, uh, we're keeping our staffing at a minimum. So we're not exposing a bunch of people at the same time. 
if we do have an exposure. Um, you can't really work at home as a fireman. No, no, we can't. So we're getting probably one extra day off a month just from, you know, minimum staff, going down to minimum staffing. Some of us get sent home. Um, but it's been, uh, it's been a little challenging with, uh, going on, going on runs and, um, uh, helping out the public. It can be kind of tough. When you show up on a scene, whether it's an EMS scene or a fire scene, I mean, you're, are you thinking about whether you might be exposed to COVID-19 on that space or what's going through your mind? Are you just like in training mode? You just do what you got to do. Uh, I guess it depends on the call. If, if there's something critical, something that's time is of the essence that is in the back of my mind, but um, we got to get our job done. So, um, but it's, it's always in the back of my mind and these, these lesser, not non-critical calls are, um, I'm thinking about it more and more, actually. That's like one of the first things I think about is, you know, I get out of the truck and I make sure I grab my mask and, um, you know, kind of distance myself from other people. Um, it's just another, another thing we're doing as of right now. It strikes me that when somebody, you know, if you show up and somebody's, you know, house is on fire, probably the last thing that they're thinking about is social distancing from the firemen. Yeah. Um, or, yeah. or are, are you finding that people are being careful with you as well? Yeah, they, they are. And I think they know our job and they know that, um, like even going like to the grocery store, we have people kind of back away from us and I, I've taken it kind of as a, they know that we're out in, in public and we may be more at risk um, than others, but we, uh, we're taking our temperature every, every morning when we come into work. And, um, so we're, we're making sure everybody's got it. Everybody's, uh, everybody's okay. You mean when you go into the grocery store, like you're wearing your fireman, not just, your whole gear, just right. Not our gear, just our, just our uniform, our uniforms. Yep. And, and people give you an extra little distance. Yep. Yep. That's kind of heartwarming to think like, I mean, it's, it's such a weird thing that to, to stay away from somebody is to care for them. It is. <laughs> People are it, taking extra care of you by staying a little further away. Yeah, it, it, it is. It, it is kind of a, a backwards thought there, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting more and more used to it. I was, it, it was a tough adjustment for, for a lot of us. Yeah. So because usually you probably used to, I mean, at least whenever we go to the Delhi area where we live, the library is there and the kids like often want to go to the fire department and the firemen mm -hmm. are very like friendly and welcoming. And, you know, if you're out and you got your fire suit on or you're not your suit, but your uniform and kids normally be coming up to you and you're like a little hero, but here they're like, it's like you're yeah. Moses parting the Red Sea. Right. But right. That's, that's them caring for you. Yeah. 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 That's a good way of putting it. Hmm. So how, how can people be in prayer for firemen for you specifically and, and firemen in general? Um, I, I would say first and foremost to, to pray for our families because uh, they're, uh, they're also, you know, at risk with us being at risk, us coming home and um, they didn't sign up for it. Mm-hmm. They just have a mom or a dad who's a firefighter and they've got to live with it. So it's, it's tough on, it's tough on them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm imagining like, like one of those decontamination like rooms with like plastic around it that you see in the yeah. and you walk in and they like have to be decontaminated before you yeah. Yeah. go into your, into your house. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we try to do that at, at work actually. We, are now showering after our shift and new new sets of clothes. We're bagging up our clothes. Yeah. So. So praying for your families. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's what I would say. Okay. Well, friends, let's take a moment and pray for Tom and for uh, the rest of uh, the firemen and women um, in our communities. God, we're grateful for these men and women who uh, um, put their lives at risk on a regular basis without a pandemic 
and now have been added this extra layer um, of risk uh, being out and about um, in the people's homes regularly. And uh, we just pray for, uh, for protection around them. We pray for wisdom about how to navigate doing their job, but also keeping a distance. We pray for encouragement um, and, uh, and for perseverance um, for this mission that you've put them on. And we pray especially for their families um, as they come home and they think about what are they bringing into the house. And um, we just ask for your peace, for your calm. Um, we pray for, for good hygiene um, uh, across the board for everybody. Um, that these men and women who are keeping us safe would be keeping their families safe as well. God, we lift all these things up in the name of Jesus and in the power of your Holy Spirit and all who agreed said, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Tom. Thanks. So good morning, Sycamore Creek. I'm Nancy Dietrich, and I get to be your host today from our remote locations. Uh, we are a church that is meeting in so many different locations, we can't even count them all. So now we are into physical distancing, that's important right now, but Sycamore Creek is not so much into social distancing. So we have lots of ways that you can connect. One of the ways is if you can check out the online uh, connection card, you can do that. We also can stay connected through the SCC MI app, which is uh, a way for you to put, still put in prayer requests, do online giving. Uh, there are just so many ways to connect right now, so please do that. You also could check into uh, social media. So if you could push this uh, link out to join right now, have your friends come in and join us and connect. Uh, you can do a the couch selfie. So if you do hashtag church couch selfie, post that up online and let people know what you're doing right now. Another way to connect is after service today, we're gonna to be doing uh, an all chat, which is a great way just to have a conversation with each other, like we used to have in the Connection Cafe. So I'm gonna be there, so hopefully uh, you will join us and I look forward to seeing all of you. So again, we have a great message today and today's message begins with this. Hello everyone, my name is Dale Wayne Williams. I'm part of the Pastor Preaching Mentor Group and I am so excited to be back in your homes with a message from Sycamore Creek Church and I could not have asked for a more vital topic to teach on. Before I get started in earnest, I'm going to ask that you say a little prayer for me because this sermon is without a doubt one of the most important messages I could preach but it is also going to be one of the most difficult messages for many of you to believe. Just ask for God to fill me with wisdom and clarity and to fill you with the openness for what you're about to hear. Last June, I went to Lake Michigan with some friends. It was a windy day and I didn't want to go when the day started, but something in me felt like I should go on this lake trip. As the day progressed, the waves got larger and the beach cleared up but my friends wanted to stick around, so we did. Around 4 p.m., the only other people in the water near us was a family consisting of a woman and two kids, one who looked about 10, the other who was maybe five. The woman was focused solely on the smaller child. Uh, the waves at this point were cresting near my shoulders, and I'm six foot one for what that's worth. Out of the corner of my eye, I see the older child uh, drifting further and further out and coming up for air for less and less time with every wave that crashed over him. I slowly inched my way closer to him and sure enough, after one wave, he didn't come up. After the second wave, his hand breached the surface of the water. I reached out, took his hand, pulled him up out of the water and then back over to his family. The woman smiled and said thank you and took the children back to shore. My friends and I continued to stand around letting the waves hit us for another hour 
until we got tired and went to the same Mexican restaurant we always go to for dinner. Uh, while talking about how our days went at the beach, one of my friends goes, well, Dale saved a kid's life. That's when it hit me. I might have saved that kid's life. I was just standing around, noticed something amiss in my periphery, and acted. I didn't feel like a hero. No, no, I wasn't a hero. I was just another guy standing in the right spot in the water. I'm going to let this story sit here, and I'll come back to it when the time is just right. We're in the second week of a four-week-long series titled I'm In. Last week, we talked about how you are invited to the family of God. In the coming weeks, we'll see how you're influential and invested. Today, I will be talking about how you, each and every individual person, there's no collective you yet, are invaluable to God's work. You are invaluable. Say it aloud a few times. Everyone, I'm invaluable. If you're on this call, I'm invaluable. I'm invaluable. I know, I know it's weird at home, but say it out loud. I'm invaluable. Go ahead and type it in the comments. I'm invaluable. I'm invaluable. Type it in Zoom. <laughs> type it on Facebook. I've got all day. Let me see it. All right. Do you hey, uh, on the family cam there, uh, unmute yourself and let's hear Mike and Sam. I'm invaluable. Oh, yes. Yeah, we do. Come on. No, Come on. no, no. They, they were know, being I'm silly. Invaluable. I'm invaluable. No. <laughs> they were saying I'm invaluable. Oh, no. no. <laughs> All right. Mute the family cam. Mute the family cam. Sorry, Dale. Carry on. You know what? I'll, I'll say it one more time for them. I'm invaluable. Now, is it coming through yet? Are you going to believe me? You're invaluable. That's what I hope you really know by the end of this message. So what exactly does invaluable mean? It doesn't mean that you don't have value or that you aren't worth a great deal, but instead that there's no possible way to ascribe a value to you. You are priceless, indispensable, and irreplaceable. You are called, chosen, capable, and invaluable to God's work. Picture, if you would, being a shepherd at the turn of the era. You've got exactly 100 sheep. They're fluffy and friendly, but more importantly, they are kind of dumb. I grew up on a farm, and you would not believe how dumb sheep can be. Now, as you're moving your sheep from one grazing spot to the next, one of them slips away. You count up the sheep when you get there, and you go, hmm. I've only got 99, but I probably just missed one. So you count again, fighting the drowsiness that comes from literally counting sheep. And sure enough, there are only 99. One of them is missing. Now, you've got these 99 perfectly healthy, wonderful sheep that are safe and accounted for. But that one, that one missing sheep is just gnawing away at you. You can't think of anything else because you love that sheep, you recognize what could happen if you leave the 99 to go look. Wolves, thieves, sheep being dumb shenanigans, anything could go wrong. However, you have to throw caution to the wind and go after that one. Now, picture you are that sheep. You're alone, you're afraid, you're kind of dumb. You just saw a tasty spot of grass, and you stopped for a bit, and now everyone else is gone. You're giving up hope, and then you see the shepherd. The shepherd came back just for you. You are filled with the joy of being so meaningful that the shepherd left all the others just for you. When Jesus told this story, this parable, he was the loving shepherd, and we are all the sheep. We're all alone and afraid. We're kind of dumb. We've lost our way, our people, our hope. But Jesus comes to find us. He leaves the rest of his flock just to come for us. That's how much we mean to God. We are that one sheep. That's, what's, that's what being invaluable is. If you had 100 AirPods and one of them goes missing, would you devote your entire life to finding where it went? 
what about with children? If you have five kids and one of them wanders away while at the zoo, then do you just call it a loss and take solace that you still have four more? No. Unlike the AirPod, the child is so invaluable that you would spend the rest of your life trying to find them. That is the level of pricelessness and irreplaceability. And that is what you mean to God. I'd like to know, I'm gonna open this up for panel discussion, type it in the comments. When was a time you lost something very valuable to you? I'm gonna turn this over to Pastor Tom to lead. All right, so uh, well, I was thinking about that. By the way, my kids are just uh, like totally giggling and cracking up in the background at the lost child, no reward uh, image there. Um, but, but I think back to like when one of the first couple years of uh, my marriage, Sarah and I, we'd love to do backpacking. Um, and I had just got this, uh, a friend of mine gave me like a hundred dollar gift certificate to Jay's Sporting Goods. If you've ever gone up north, you see the Jay's Sporting Goods signs. And, and I was living in Petoskey and I drove to Jay's Sporting Goods and I bought something. I bought a luxury item that I wouldn't normally buy. For me. I got a, a real leather, like, like one of them, you know, the, it's, it's the multi-tool, all of the various knives that come out and, and so on. And, and, so in Puckasaw National Park on the North Shore of Lake Superior. And, uh, we left it at a campsite and we didn't realize until about an hour into continuing on backpacking, at which point we realized we've lost the Leatherman. It was like a hundred bucks or more. And uh, we've been hiking for an hour. We have no can opener. We have no uh, knives. We're, we're toast. And so we turned around and went back to find it. And obviously we did uh, because here it is. Hey Jeremy, have you ever lost, have you ever had experience like that? Yeah. Well, first I want wanted to share with Sarah that I wonder um, you E W E better have a story to tell with us. Um, so one time, Tom and I went canoeing, and Tom gave me a, a nice backpacker <laughs> knife. And, I forgot uh, all about this. We sat down on the riverbank and started cutting cheese with the knife, and I set it next to me. And um, Tom was like, beforehand, he said, this is really like a rites of passage. You got your own like knife. And I leave that sucker right on the, uh, the bank of the Manistee River to never found it again. That's my story. I never bought you another one. You haven't. Hey, uh, Gretchen, what are people saying? Are any, any good stories on Facebook or in the comments of uh, people losing things? I haven't seen any comments yet, but I was actually thinking of something that happened the other day with my, my dad. Yeah. And myself is that um, I came home from going to the store and doing some other things, and we had to go to Hope School because they had a parade for the end of the school year. And when we're getting in the car, he says, "Do you have the keys?" And I was like, "No." And I'm telling you, we tore that house apart for like ten minutes. I'm like going on about how ridiculous I am. I can't believe that I lost the keys. I just got home a few minutes ago. And then finally I looked down and I see something dangling from dad's like waistband, like his belt loop. And I'm like, are those the keys right there? And he like looked and they were the keys. And I was like, dad, I was so mad at myself and it's your fault. <laughs> Nancy, you lost something invaluable. You can you put it in there in the chat. What? Tell us that yeah. story. I lost the diamond out of my wedding ring. Oh, and, man. Uh, you know, it, somewhere, no, we never found it. It took about 10 years uh, to save up and replace, you know, before money was such that I would spend money to replace the diamond on my ring. So, What kind um, of ring did Dwayne give you? Man. <laughs> <laughs> it was out of a bubblegum machine. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> anyway, did, so. Did, did you find it in the rough? <laughs> no, we found a replacement in the diamond store. All right. All right. Well, hey, Dale, uh, we're sending it back to you. All right. Uh, thank you for sharing. So we are each invaluable, but unfortunately, this is the exact opposite of what most of us feel within the church and in our lives in general. Look at the world around us. We are still in the middle of a pandemic. 
And COVID-19 has rendered so many of us to feelings of being powerless. On top of that, we have another pressing issue regarding police brutality, systemic racism, and a justice system that has left millions of our brothers and sisters feeling marginalized, abused, if not dead. Right now, I know there are times where I feel the opposite of invaluable. I feel worthless. I'm powerless against the virus, and I can't fix the broken and harmful attitudes, thoughts, and actions that pervade our society and country. At this time in all of our lives, it could be especially difficult to feel invaluable. And trust me, you wouldn't be alone in this feeling. We see stories about grand revivals where a preacher leads one or two thousand people to the Lord in a single day. We hear people pray the most powerful prayers that we just know God heard and will respond to. We watch as people give away million, millions and millions of dollars worth of supplies and aid to the least fortunate among us. In the midst of all of that, we think, I'm not good enough. I'm not that talented or important. I'll never know enough scripture or theology. I'll never pray so beautifully. We feel completely unworthy. One of the biggest lies, lies so many believe in the church is that if they weren't here, it wouldn't matter. I know I've believed that before. Let's start picking away at this feeling by turning to scripture. We'll be looking at a passage today in 1 Corinthians 12, starting with verse 12. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Today we'll be using this metaphor, that we are each one piece of the body of Christ, to look at what makes each of us so invaluable to God's work. Let's play a little game. Go ahead and keep score and see how many of these you get right. If you're watching with the family, try and go for bragging rights. All of these questions are going to ask uh, the name for various collectives of animals. Uh, let's start with some easier ones. Hey, let's uh, unmute the family cam and Mike and Sam, let's, let's have them join in. All right. And feel free to type in the comments, type in chat if you have a guess. What is a group of elephants called? Do we have any? I've, no, I've seen, I, yep. They're called a herd. What? So that's, herd of elephants, that's, herd boys. that's an easy one. So uh, how about a group of lions? A herd. Oh, a pride. Never. Yeah, that's right. I heard it. I heard it shouted out. A answer. group of lions is a pride. Let's let's go to a more difficult one. What is a group of cheetahs called? Oh, Sam, cheetahs. A group of cheetahs. <laughs> cheetahs. So what? this is a difficult one. A the U U of N football team is a group of cheetahs. <laughs> What is the uh, the uh, Patriots, some cheetahs there. No, um, no, a group of cheetahs is called a coalition. So oh. if you're three for three, and good work, because that was a hard one. So let's go for the next one. What is a group of donkeys called? Careful with this one. I have an idea of what you're thinking. And before Ass. you go too far, <laughs> a group of donkeys is called a pace. I don't really get that one. So three more, and these ones are all related to groups of birds because they get some really fun names. Does anyone know what a group of owls is called? They're really solitary, so you don't see many groups of owls. <laughs> I love that picture so much. But a group of owls is... They're, they're called a parliament. Good job. Shout out to Aaron and Sabrina. Yes. Does, so a little more difficult. Does anyone know what a group of vultures is called? A murder. Nope, not a murder. Vultures. A murder of crows. Yeah, vultures form a committee. 
very <laughs> a lot of very bureaucratic names. That's why we don't have committees at Sycamore <laughs> Creek. <laughs> so unfortunately, someone yelled this out already, but my the last one and my favorite asks about a group of crows. Which unlike others, they don't get a nice fancy bureaucratic name. They're a murder. It's a murder of crows. You're so murder. The next time, <laughs> The next time you have a few crows on your lawn, uh, be sure to grab someone and point out the murder in progress. Uh, beautiful pun. It will only elicit a few groans or sighs of lost respect. I promise. I really can't promise that. I'm sorry. But individually, each of these animals has a name. And not like, you know, Steve or Carl or Jennifer but like lions and cheetahs. But together, they have a new identity as a part of the collective. Likewise, people surrendered to Christ have a name, Christians. But what do we call a group of people surrendered to Christ? Well, the church is one name for the collective, but as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, we come together to form the body of Christ. Together, we are his body. That is our collective. We are hands made to serve, feet made to go, mouths made to share, and hearts made to love. You, yes, you, are an invaluable part of this body of Christ. And here's the kicker. Every part of the body matters. Let that sink in a bit. Every part of the body matters. Say it in your head a few times. Every part of the body matters. Say it out loud. Every part of the body matters. Everyone, I want to hear matters. it. Type it in the comments. Every, every, part, of the body every part of the body matters. Every part of the body matters. Every part of the body matters. First Corinthians 12 continues at verses 14 through 17 by saying, yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, does that not make it? That does not make it any less a part of the body. If the ear says, I am not a part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? If the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? One more time, every part of the body matters. Look at how every part of the body matters. Look at how Paul contrasts the parts of the body here. Uh, the hand and foot drama is mentioned, but my favorite is the contrast between the ear and the eye. The ear feels inferior to the eye, and it's easy to see why. Uh, no one cares about the ears. Our society gives all its attention to the eyes. When was the last time you've heard someone compliment someone by saying they have beautiful ears. Uh, no one in love ever stares longingly into the ear. If your partner does, I'm sorry, but you need to break up. That, that one's kind of strange. Uh, please tell me about the last time you had an ear-to-ear -ear conversation with someone. And while you're at it, I'd love to know your opinion of the classic 1981 Bond film, for your ears only. Uh, where is beauty? Well, obviously, beauty is in the ear of the beholder, and that one actually feels a little gross to say, and I don't like it. The list of eye attention goes on with no love for ears. You've got bedroom ears, got stars in my ears, you're the apple of my ear. The ear says, I'm not that important, and no one ever focuses on or cares about the ear, but without the ear, how could you hear? Every part of the body matters. Every part of the body matters. Don't believe me yet? Ask someone who's losing their hearing or who is blind how important the ear and all of its components are to them. Still in 1 Corinthians 12, but jumping ahead to verses 22 and 27. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. 
Of course we know the value of hands and feet, of eyes and ears, but what about those parts of the bodies we don't think about, the parts of the body we pay so little attention to, but without them, it would change our life. Uh, take your hand, and think about the most important digit on it. Well, obviously, the thumb is necessary to grab and hold. Opposable thumbs allow us to hold tools, give a nice thumbs up, you know, hitchhike, all of that. There's an argument that this is the most important part of the hand. What about the other fingers? Uh, symbolically, the index, middle, and ring fingers are important. The index finger is how we point. The ring finger is where we put the ring that symbolizes our love and commitment. And the middle finger, you know that one. There's still one finger left though, the pinky. It's the smallest and not used nearly as much, but that one small finger at the anterior of your hand provides roughly 50% of your hand's strength. The pinky is that important. Another small and relatively unseen part of the human body is the uvula. What's the uvula, you might ask? Well, it's that little dangly thing at the back of your mouth where the throat sits. The uvula does a lot more than you might expect. Over the course of your lifetime, this little part of the body secretes enough saliva to fill two swimming pools. That's gross. Ew, but cool. <laughs> Armpit hair also serves a vital function. It diffuses natural smell to help attract a mate. So many unseen or small parts of the body do so many useful things. Sometimes what you do is not as visible as what someone else may do. Like the uvula, just because it's not visible doesn't mean it's not important. All right, panelists and those of you at home, take some time and let me know. What are some other lesser known or seemingly unimportant body parts that you have a fact about? Or how does it contribute in a way that we may not notice? All right, so um, I, I'm gonna throw the arch of the foot as one of these things, um, partly because for like five or six years, I've had chronic uh, bad um, plantar fasciitis, uh, which is probably not plantar fasciitis anymore. It's been so bad for so long that I can barely walk. And it's really like an issue of, of the of the arch that's the plantar fascia and you know you don't even think about that ligament that goes from the back of your foot to the front of your foot but when it's not working it's painful um that's actually been one of the blessings is i get to sit during worship right now <laughs> whereas usually when we're in a space i'm on my feet all morning long hey nancy have you got uh, uh something uh, that you've had an experience like that Unmute, sorry. <laughs> um, well, probably something you don't think about much until it goes wrong is the sciatic nerve. Um, I uh, was pregnant with Abby and I'd never had back pain in my life. And um, here the last three weeks before she was born, she was like sitting on my sciatic nerve and I could hardly move. So you don't think about it when it's working well and you can walk and balance and bend. And But yeah, when it goes wrong, it goes really wrong. Yeah, yeah. Gretchen, are people posting anything in the comments uh, besides ridiculous things about the spleen? Well, apparently the spleen is very important. Uh, Star Lalone talked about the gallbladder. She mm -hmm. said, I didn't know what it did until I had mine re removed due to pain. The thyroid, that's Megan McElwee said that. That's true because if you have thyroid problems, it's a big issue. Um, I was looking some stuff up because I wanted to come up with something really cool. Did you know that your stomach regenerates like every three to four days? Ugh. Uh, wow. So the lining of your stomach is continually replaced by new cells. So basically you're getting a new stomach every three to four days. All right, Carolyn, you're talking about eyelashes. Tell us about eyelashes. Well, like your eyelashes are important for keeping dirt and stuff out of your eyes, um, but more importantly, bugs. In my case, um, I had a bug like fly in the, the side of my eye and die there. So it was really nice to actually be able to get them out without Man, touching my eye. We, we had an eye, something in the eye situation in the Arthur family. Sam got something in his eye 
and it was like World War III happened. Um, and you, you think about like the eyebrows and the eyelashes okay. and all those things, the eyelids that keep you stuff know, out of the eye. Yeah. Well, I think the, the, the uh, sinus is something that we take for granted, but it's got a, a real significant purpose, obviously. When I was in high school once, I sneezed while eating a French fry, and the French fry got lodged in my sinus and didn't come out for a week later when I sneezed again and the French fry was white. Isn't that, that is, gross? Another that, thing, another thing, disgusting. I know, another thing is, is I broke my humerus bone, but that's not funny. Mute him, Thomas, mute him. Um, oh man, all right. Well, hey Dale, I, th I think we've had enough of that. Um, so we're gonna send it back to you. I, I really don't know where to go from here, but I I'll do my best. <laughs> try to, try to, try to salvage it. Like many small and unseen parts of the body, we may be a part of the body of Christ that goes unnoticed, but that doesn't mean we aren't doing anything. Take the Gideons. The Gideons started out as a group of business people who would leave Bibles in hotel rooms. Today, they are an international organization with a network of volunteers distributing the Bible almost everywhere imaginable. Now, one Gideon may hand out hundreds or thousands of Bibles and expect that they'll be ignored or thrown away. But what about that one Bible that is given to a person and it makes a difference? Maybe it brings them to Christ. Maybe it brings them one step closer. Or perhaps it changes their perception of Christians. Here's an example about how a Gideon handing out one Bible can move someone. This video is Pendulet, a magician in Las Vegas and an atheist. He's talking about the time a businessman gave him a Bible after one of his shows. How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that, that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. And I've always thought that, and I've written about that, and I've thought of it conceptually. But this guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane, and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a, a Bible, which had written in it a little note to me, uh, not very personal, but just, you know, liked your show and so on. And then like five phone numbers for him and an email address if I wanted to get in touch. Now, I know there's no God, and one polite person living his life right doesn't change that. Uh, but I'll tell you, he was a very, very, very good man. And uh, that's really important. And with that kind of goodness, uh, it's okay to have that deep of a disagreement. I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff, but man, that was a good man who gave me that book. That's all I wanted to say. That's amazing coming out of the mouth of an atheist. Yeah, and Penn is still an outspoken atheist, but you can see that this small action moved him. And if it moved him in that way, just think of all the others who could be moved in a similar or even greater way. So again, every part of the body matters, and you are called, chosen, capable, and invaluable to God's work. The church, the whole body of Christ, each individual piece and part, that's you, needs to be involved. Serving, loving, or contributing somewhere in the world, or there is something that God wants done that isn't being done. How many of you have broken a leg or an arm? If you have a broken leg, then you have to use the rest of your body to make up for what would normally be simple walking. All the pressure is now on your unbroken leg and your upper body carrying the crutches. When a part of the body isn't working correctly, then the rest of the body has to work harder to make up for it. I saw it in the Facebook comments, someone talking about the pinky toe, and I broke that toe once, the smallest toe 
on my Ouch. right foot. And for weeks, every step I took caused pain and my balance was completely thrown off. That tiny little toe blew the entire process of walking out of whack. Now with the metaphor of the body, that seems pretty unimportant. The leg will heal, the toe will heal, and we'll walk normally again, hopefully. But when we're talking about the world, when a part of the body of Christ isn't working, then the church isn't working towards its fullest potential. Something isn't being accomplished. There is a need that isn't being met. There's a life that isn't being changed. Mm. And now you're sitting there thinking, great job, Dale. You've let me know how important I am, but now I feel like I failed God. Good news. <laughs> Maybe not the greatest news, but still, we've all failed God and other people. But that doesn't mean we aren't qualified to start making a change for the future. That marriage that fell apart, the time you were so deep in debt you declared bankruptcy, the moment when you felt like you messed up beyond repair with your child or a friend, all of those things don't disqualify us from God's work. They prepare us. Maybe you're sitting at home today thinking, I can't lead a small group, not after the divorce. Well, you could be the perfect person to help others heal from similar situations. You might be in a place where you believe you don't know enough to help further God's work. But if you know Jesus and love people, that's more than enough knowledge required. Perhaps a drug or alcohol or pornography or gambling or any other addiction from your past keeps haunting you. Surely you couldn't be a minister after all or any of that. No, God will use your story to inspire others. Let me tell you, for years I felt like God had given up on me. I was too depressed to be useful. How can someone who tried twice to take their own life, who actively defied the idea that his life had meaning, be of use to God? I was a failure. I couldn't meet the high expectation people put on me as a gifted student. I ate too much and drank too much. I was utterly and profoundly meaningless. I wasn't worth anything. How could I be helpful to God? Well, I play bass guitar. God used that as a skill to get me involved with the church more than just sitting in the chairs on Sunday. God also used other interests and talents to nudge me towards ministry. And while I'm still growing and learning what my spiritual gifts in Christ are, I'm trusting God to lead me to where I need to be. In the end, it's not about your ability. It's about your availability. All you have to do is say yes to God, and he'll put you to work. He'll put you exactly in the place you need to be. In the big scheme of the world, and in every mundane detail, what you do can impact in ways you'd never know. All because you said yes to God and did what you do best as a part of the body of Christ. Each and every one of you has a story. And your story matters. You have a voice and your voice matters. Your words matter. Your gifts and generosity matter. Your encouragement matters. When you give an offering, your gift makes a difference. When you pray, your faith moves the heart of God. That invite to church could change the life of someone struggling. When you greet someone on the street, when you listen to someone opening up about their life, when you invite someone into your home, when you make a meal, then you are showing the love of Jesus. Whatever you do for the least of these, you are doing for Jesus. Right now, during this time of injustice, of pain, when so many around us are suffering, the church, the body of Christ, and most importantly, you are more invaluable than ever. You have a duty to the marginalized and hurting worldwide, but right now in the U.S., in Michigan, in the city you call home, for me, that's Lansing. You have a duty to your brothers and sisters, to your neighbors, to all those who Christ would have shown love and compassion to, which means everyone, especially in this moment, your black and brown brothers and sisters. 
I am appalled by how many Christians I've seen tear down their brothers and sisters in the last week instead of building them up. I don't have all the answers on what we can do, but let me just offer three points of advice to show the love of Christ and be an agent of good in the world as a part of his body. First, give whatever you can. Donate your money or your time. Second, help alleviate the suffering, the fear, and the brutal injustice of those around you. I could spend hours here ranting and lecturing about how we should behave as the body of Christ, but instead, I'll pose one question and leave it at that. What would Christ do during these times? If your answer is anything that doesn't boil down to, he'd do whatever is necessary to comfort those living in fear and suffering, you want to take a deeper look at your answer. Third, Beyond giving and helping alleviate fear, pray and act. If we, as the body of Christ, if you, as a part of that body, took to heart the commandments of love given to us, if we prayed for healing and guidance, if we truly believed in the powerful ways that faith can change the world, then we and you could change the world, would change the world. The devil's in the details, though, and we have to act. If God gives us the means to provide for people while you're praying for people to be provided for, then act and give those provisions, whatever they might be. 1 John 3.17 says, If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? For too long, the body of Christ has been inactive. We can't let a leg fall asleep or get broken and stay that way forever. Just think about all that we can accomplish, first in our community, then throughout the world, if we just acted and move as the body of Christ. None of our brothers and sisters would ever feel trapped under the weight of institutionalized racism or police brutality. Every widow and elderly person would have their needs met. They would never feel lonely or forgotten, go hungry, or be set on the fringe of our society again. All of those people, like me, who felt rejected, alone, depressed, or worthless, they could feel God's love through his people. And not just any random person, but you, you can help people feel God's love. Every foster child or orphan could know and have the comfort of a loving family. We could make the word of God available to billions of people at no cost to them. We could mentor youth. Every pregnant woman with no partner who is scared and losing hope could feel support and love as they step through our doors. Every person trapped in addiction could find freedom in Christ. Every lost person in your community, whether that be lost in sin, self-doubt, sorrow, grief, or any other trial or tribulation, they could hear and feel and know the love of Jesus. Remember that story I told you at the start of this message? That was the moment I knew I was invaluable. Not because of anything in my power, but because I listened and went. I was where God needed me to be. And because of that, I know there is a kid out there who gets to live out his life. I don't know his name. And if he remembers that day, I'll be the random bearded guy with tattoos and flower print swim trunks that pulled him from the water. However, God used me to save a life. That voice telling me to go to the beach on a day where I felt worthless and just wanted to stay in my house, overeat, and then go to a bar where I could drink away some of the feelings of uselessness was God's way of saying that even, even when I didn't feel useful or worthy, I was actually invaluable. And looking back on my life, I've noticed many times where I've done something truly helpful and meaningful. And it's because I went a different route than usual or tried something a little differently. And before, um, before I knew it, I had noticed something or someone I could aid. I saw something on the periphery that needed my help and I helped. The part of the body most associated with controlling peripheral vision is a tiny nerve cell in the eye largely located outside the center of the retina, the rods. They help with night and low light vision, but they also help us see things to our side. 
things we might not otherwise notice. And while of course, I'd love to be a hand or a heart or the brain, if my place in the body of Christ is a tiny nerve cell that helps us see on the periphery and can change lives in that way, then I'm happy to serve my invaluable purpose to God's work. Remember that every part of the body matters. We need feet to deliver the good news. We need hands to offer help to those without. We need the floating hyoid bone, which enables words to give hope to the hurting. We need eyes to see and ears to hear the plights of those who are suffering. Pinkies to give our hands strength. Armpit hair to diffuse smell. And I'll let you make an analogy to how that is used to serve our world. You, each and every one of you are the body of Christ. Every part of the body matters and you are invaluable to God's work. Join me in prayer. Heavenly gracious Father, thank you. Thank you for bringing us into your body and for making us invaluable. Please let those who are suffering, who don't know, who don't feel that invaluability, know that they are irreplaceable, indispensable, that there is no way any value could be put on them. They may be that one sheep, but you are coming for them. And for those of us in the 99, for those who are part of the body, don't let us forget our invaluability that each and every one of us needs to be working for you. Fill us with your grace, with your love, with your spirit. Give us wisdom to act. Don't let us sit out. Don't let us be a part of the body that falls asleep. Let us know our invaluability. Let us be that part of the body and let us change the world for you. It's in your glorious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, friends. Let's hear it. Amen. Dale. Thank Not you. Dale. Dale. Amen. Um, preach that, Dale. Preach it. I want you all to know Dale has been in my preaching mentor group, uh, preaching pastor mentor group for, it's been like a year, year and a half, two years. He, he and I had a conversation sitting at Buddy's uh, at the bar one night uh, about his sense of call to be a pastor. And uh, he has started in that process of exploring that with the United Methodist Church. And that means at some point we will all have to affirm that. In Rock Dale. on. It would be like, you know, we all have to vote that we agree that Dale um, is in that process. So um, I think you saw a little bit of that this morning. Not everybody who's in that preaching mentor group, pastor mentor group wants to be or feels called to be a pastor. Some of them just feel called to preach. Um, but Dale uh, is, is kind of taking the next step. So thank you, God, for Dale. And, uh, and Dale, you are invaluable to us. Um, it's bittersweet to get you on that process. Uh, um, but we recognize that that's a part of the bigger body of Christ. Um, so we thank you again, friends, give it up for Dale. Thank God for Dale this morning in the comment section. Um, and especially just for that message, because every part of the body matters, especially the part that's hurting right now. And that's, that's a message that is so important right now when it comes to the racial tensions in our, in our culture, in our world. Okay. Every part, especially the part that hurts, um, needs special attention, special love, special care right now, right now. Okay. Hey, a couple of things I want you to, to connect with you on. One is we would love to connect with you. Okay. And, and we want to connect with you and you to connect with us. The way that you do that is with our connection card, sycamorecreekchurch.org slash connect. Go to, go to that link um, and, and fill out that connection card. That's going to get you in the know of everything that we do. Okay. Right now, we need to be connected to something bigger than ourselves more than we ever have before, okay? So fill out that connection card. Also right now, our summer small groups are up and running. Um, many of them are online. Um, in fact, almost all of them are online. And usually we have like a, a whole brochure. We've put that brochure online. It's sycamorecreekchurch.org slash small groups. 
and you can go and fill out a, 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 and join a small group, all right? You express interest in the small group leader will be in touch with you for that small group, okay? Um, don't, one thing I've noticed, I've noticed like we, we've contracted um, in, in this time of, of sheltering in place, and, and we've contracted and we, we really have got to some point like put our vision back outward. And small groups is a way to do that. The connection card is a way to do that. I um, mean, also volunteering for the mission of Sycamore Creek. You can do that, uh, it's, again, on that connection card, sycamorecreekchurch.org slash connect. Connect, all right, in some way this week. Connect with us digitally. Um, one of the small groups that I especially wanna highlight right now is tonight I'm starting a small group looking at the book, Holy Love, A Biblical Theology of Human Sexuality. Um, our denomination was on the verge of splitting before the pandemic, um, and that has been postponed here. It's kind of strange to think that a, a denominational split has been postponed. But this issue of human sexuality, um, it didn't go away. If you were queer before the quarantine, you're still queer in the quarantine. Um, and we're going to take time uh, tonight for the next four Sunday nights to explore the biblical um, reasons for um, affirming, for loving our queer, our gay, our LGBTQIA brothers and sisters. Um, so join me tonight from 7 to 830. That's a small group. You do it through our all chat. Same, it's like kind of going into the digital cafe, sycamorecreekchurch.org slash all chat. But you can sign up for that small group and lots of others at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash small groups. We want you to know that we are so appreciative of your continued giving. Um, our mission didn't disappear just because we stopped meeting in the building, okay? We, we've been doing so many things of connecting people to God and each other over the last several weeks. Your giving has helped us uh, respond to, to the racism in our culture. Your giving has helped us uh, send Bibles to second graders. Your giving is going to help us celebrate our graduates next week. Um, there are so many ways your giving has helped. Thank you so much. Uh, many of you have moved to electronic giving. I mean, we already got 60 to 70 percent of our giving electronically before the pandemic, and now that percentage is even higher. You can do that on the app, or you can go to sycamorecreekchurch.org slash give. Lots of different ways that you can continue to support the mission of Sycamore Creek and as Dale pointed out, you are the mission. You are invaluable to the mission. Not just giving, but you are invaluable in your time and your talents um, as well. So, so I'm in. That's what this whole series is about. I'm in. I'm in to volunteer. I'm in to give. I'm in, I'm in to support the mission of Sycamore Creek. One way your giving has helped is that we have adopted teachers from Mount Hope Steam School over the last week or two, and we are sending them appreciation packages We've given each teacher, there are 16 teachers plus the principal makes 17. And Marilyn and Marty Gonzalez sent us a picture of their care package. And there it is. Um, you see all the goodies. I don't know which teacher that they adopted, but, but one of those teachers is going to get this. Principal Raymond Fries told me that he hasn't told them that this is happening. So they're just going to get this surprise. It's our way of saying, we remember you. We are so thankful for the work that you have done to make the transition to whatever it has been um, as a teacher. I mean, talk about hard. It's been hard for us as parents teaching our kids at home. It's been hard for teachers too. So we are appreciating them because uh, they are invaluable. I mean, that we have learned that again, more than we've ever learned before, that, that they are invaluable to the life of our children. All right. So thank you so much. Your giving has made that happen. All right, we're gonna head out into the Connection Cafe in just, in, in just a minute here, but we're gonna talk about this question while we're in the cafe, and that is, besides a family member or a pet, if your house was on fire and Tom Roush was running in, because he says, I'm in to save one thing, what one item would you save that was invaluable? I've got mine here uh, on my bed. Somebody had, um, had our wedding, uh, let's see if I can get it without the, had our wedding, um, invitations uh, framed. And this is one thing that I can't replicate digitally. Um, and so this is really valuable to me. I have it hanging in my bedroom. But what's that one thing that you would find invaluable? Post it in the comments. Um, and you can't say your pet or your, or your, or your kid or your spouse or your friend. Um, right? You should take a picture of that. 
what what one thing all right sparkles sparkles that's that's his stuff here all right post it in the comment section then join me in the all chat afterwards sycamore creek church all chat and we will talk about it hey we're sending us out today with uh tara streeter Man. covering the song uh ellie golding's song burn listen to this if you are in you are on fire all right tara take us out She goes. Ooh, we, we don't have to worry about nothing. Cause we got the fire and we're burning one hell of a something. They, they're gonna see us from outer space, outer space, light it up. Like we're the stars of the human race, human race. When the lights turn it out. Digital Cafe. Join us over there at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash all chat. And uh, we'll be back next week with I'm in. We'll see you soon. <laughs>